Welcome back to another session of Solar Academy and Suncast Media's Untangling the Grid, which is a fact or it's a problem for all of us um, that are in this DER decarbonization world, understanding the grid environment here in the United States and how we can lower the cost and increase the speed of deploying the things we want to see. Today is an absolutely incredible session um, following on the good work of Ted Thomas um, that we did in sessions 101 and 201 around education uh, of this very unique environment of our transmission and distribution network for electricity in the United States. Um, today, we are joined by uh, former chairman of FERC, uh, John Wellinghoff, and also former, former chairman of FERC, Neil Chatterjee. Uh, Ted Thomas is also joining us. Um, unfortunately, Neil is en route somewhere, and Ted is also en route somewhere, especially during these July holiday weekends. Um, and so they're not able to join by video, but um, we will hear them throughout the conversation. And uh, I'll be sure if it's not clear to indicate who is speaking. Um, so let me get right into it and introduce um, Chairman John Wellinghoff, who is a friend. And last time we saw each other was over coffee in the East Bay. Um, which was a real joy. Um, and I, I'm very proud to say that John is a California born uh, man attorney, spent a lot of his life in uh, Nevada, um, where he's been working uh, on this energy transition issue for uh, increased renewables, energy efficiency, electrification of mobility. Um, John himself was the principal author behind the renewable portfolio standards for the great state of Nevada. Um, a very proud moment, I'm sure. Uh, first wins, early wins are great ones. Um, John is a longtime advocate of energy customers, and I think we all dare not call them rate payers, although the uh, certain parties do like to call them that. Um, we like to think about end users that can participate in the energy markets fairly, equally, and safely, um, and uh, demand response, and of course, load flexibility plays a role in that. Um, John, under President George W. Bush, served as a uh, federal regulatory commissioner um, starting in 2006 and into the Obama term uh, as the FERC chair until 2013. Uh, FERC chair Wellinghoff led on programs and market instruments to support decarbonization of the electrical and mobility systems for all Americans, including the cashback cars concept, which is something we may talk about today, or we may not talk about today, but it's a very interesting concept that was a sort of an early bird of how V2G might work out and how we value that uh, rolling energy storage. After his work at FERC, um, Wellinghoff led uh, SolarCity and eventually Tesla, but only for a moment, energy policy work. And today, John serves along with a good friend of mine, uh, Greg, at, as the chief policy officer of Voltus a leading demand flexibility aggregator and market maker. So that's the introduction for Mr. John Wellinghoff. And thank you very much, Chairman Wellinghoff, for joining us here today. Um, also, not on video, but on audio, we have uh, Chairman Neil Chatterjee, um, directly after receiving his JD from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Uh, Chairman Chatterjee served as policy advisor to the U.S. Representative Deborah Price from Ohio. Uh, then a policy advisor for, and this is a really awesome one, National Renewal, uh, Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA, um, representing 42 million American energy users across 47 states being served by not-for-profit cooperative energy providers. Um, super awesome work. Uh, Neil then served uh, Senator Mitch McConnell from Kentucky as a policy advisor for seven years. Uh, and in 2017, Chairman Chatterjee was elected to FERC and served under President Trump, I think uniquely twice, um, <laughs> stepping back to be a commissioner for a minute and then back to being uh, the chairman uh, to complete his term. Uh, he is now a policy advisor, senior policy advisor at Hogan Lovells, a leading uh, law firm and thought leader in the energy space. Uh, so thank you, Chairman Chatterjee, for joining us today. And finally, but definitely not the least, uh, we have Ted Thomas, a, who is a the, who was the uh, chairman of the Arkansas Public Service Commission um, from 2013 to 2022. Uh, Ted is a longtime advocate of open access for the electrical network and a strong proponent of solar electricity, and as as it has become the lowest cost electron, and he, it will serve all people, and that's important. I think something we all share. 
Um, born and raised in Arkansas, uh, Ted led session 201 and, and 101, previous sessions of this Untangling the Grid episode, and you'll see that in the show notes. So as a housekeeping method, um, we will have the presentation materials that we're going to show today um, in the show notes, and we'll also have any other support materials in the show notes as we get along here. So I just want to make sure everyone can see this because we're going to use this as a speaking mechanism for prompting ourselves. Uh, this does feel a little bit like a um, school environment, um, and uh, that's sort of the some of the point of it. Um, and, and this is, again, a production of Solar Academy and Suncast Media, uh, focusing on untangling the grid. This is session 301, and we are going to be working on the question of answering the question of why is it so expensive and time consuming to interconnect the things that we want to see solar electricity generation wind electricity generation energy storage assets ev charging infrastructure valuing demand side flexibility etc and today is a special uh, episode with chairman wellinghoff and chairman chatterjee discussing potential solutions and there's a six six components here uh, some are reaches some are immediately possible. And I am going to hand off to Chairman Wellinghoff to lead from this point forward. So thank you, Chairman Wellinghoff. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's an issue of why is it so expensive and time consuming to interconnect these things? And then why is it, you know, so difficult to ensure that uh, we can't, um, you know, accelerate their deployment as well, not only with interconnection, but, but you know, with utilization by consumers, um, you know, and there are, you know, a number of solutions that I think I um, threw out there um, for everybody to consider. And, you know, and, and the first uh, category, I think, of those solutions, is, if I remember correctly, is that... Um, uh, one thing I I came to believe in firmly at FERC was that we need to incorporate competition into the system in a much more robust way than we have now. And here I'm indicating both at the retail, wholesale, and and potentially even at the transmission level. And that's one thing we tried to do. Speaking about transmission first, since we uh, our question does initially discuss interconnection. Um, that's one thing we tried to do in Order 1000 when I was at FERC, myself and my fellow colleagues and, and one of my Republican colleagues at FERC, uh, uh, Commissioner Mark Spitzer, was a huge proponent of incorporating the competition uh, into Order 1000. Um, and a uh, huge proponent of eliminating what was called the right of first refusal, where uh, traditionally, incumbent utilities within the states, especially those states with vertically integrated utilities um, uh, that were monopoly uh, providers of services, uh, insisted upon having the, the right to first determine whether or not they could build a transmission project without any uh, competition coming in to uh, um, bid on that project to determine if it could be done faster, quicker, um, at a lower cost. And we removed that uh, right from uh, federal law in Order 1000. And unfortunately, the utilities are um, clawing it back. In fact, I was talking to uh, some people in Kansas this morning where they're trying to put in a ROFR law there, right of first refusal law there, that would um, contravene the provisions of FERC Order 1000, of course, and, and that's being challenged now in the federal courts. Um, and they challenged a, a similar law in Texas. So uh, with not with not going on too too far here to let my, my colleague Neil step into this, but, but I believe that we should put uh, as much competition into the development of transmission as possible. Certainly, with wholesale markets, and we can talk. We'll talk about that a little later. Wholesale markets should be competitive, and there should be wholesale competitive markets as broadly as possible. And then, even at the retail side, and something I tried to do in Nevada uh, that was unsuccessful, 
And this is something that hasn't got, gained a lot of trend, uh, attraction uh, yet, but I think it, it needs to, and that is having uh, consumers have more retail access, like they do in Texas, for example, and a number of other states. Uh, we need to have consumers uh, have uh, those competitive options. And, and with that, John, I'll stop and I'll, I'll turn it over to Neil and, and let him uh, provide some comments on this issue. Well, thank you both uh, for having me today. Appreciate the kind introduction, John, and, uh, and your remarks, Chairman Young Hoff. Uh, my apologies for not being on camera. That said, I've been told repeatedly that I have a face for podcasts. So I think audio only is just fine for this. Um, I think one of the interesting things that my friend Chairman Young Hoff noted is that we both have a firm belief in competition and a belief that competition leads to cost discipline and drives and stimulates innovation. And I think it was a hallmark of both of our 10 years at FERC that we focused on competition. And it's interesting, he was appointed by a Democratic president. I was appointed by a Republican president, but in many ways, our legacies, the commission, are intertwined because a lot of the work that I did during my tenure at FERC that I'm most proud of, quite frankly, built on the work that Chairman Wellinghouse started. And it was really through this kind of consistent uh, view that competition will enable us to, you know, really and truly extract all of the benefits and the excitement of the energy transition. And you know, the framework for this discussion today is around the challenges, the cost implications, the obstacles to getting more renewables, more solar, more wind, more storage connected to the grid. But I, I tend to view this through a more positive lens. But this is actually an exciting opportunity. And yes, there will be obstacles to getting there. But the fact that we were even having this conversation, to me, uh, is an indicator that uh, the advancements that we've had, particularly when it comes to technological innovation and some of the market reform to enable that innovation to be compensated and to thrive, has put us in a, in a very exciting place. And where I would love to kind of focus the discussion uh, today is around, you know, some of those market new changes that I got to work on that built on what Chairman Wellinghouse started. Um, two of the orders that I'm proudest of, FERC Order 41 and FERC Order 2222, removing barriers to entry for energy storage and aggregated distributed energy resources. Um, these are predicated on the notion of competition and opening up markets to enable these new technologies to thrive and to be compensated for all of their attributes for capacity for energy services. And uh, I, I think working together, we can all uh, embrace and overcome some of the obstacles that we certainly face. The interconnection process is an issue we can talk about the future of markets and competition and what you know the the current policy and political outlook is uh, there are opportunities and headwinds in front of us but i appreciate the opportunity to discuss them today and uh it's great to be here with uh with esteemed folks like Kevin Weinhoff and uh and, and my friend Ted Thomas as well Thank you, uh, Chairman Chatterjee. A great, great place to start is with competition. And, and John, I think you've raised a very good point is we're not just talking about access to a network. We're talking about fairly valuing the operation of these assets in a network. And I, I think I, I probably failed in posing the question because it's not just interconnecting these assets. It's really uh, having the true value of these assets be realized. And that is not always possible if you're being punitive on the rate structure or on the interconnection or whatever it might be. But I, I think I might want to revise my own question around this. It's not just access, it's a fair value of operation. Uh, and it's a great point about that you both make about competition of these assets 
one to the next. Sadly, unfortunately, John citing something here in Kansas, uh, as of this morning, seems to be uh, an incumbent looking again to uh, usurp or take advantage of their of their position and not have a competitive process around transmission. But hopefully that will get resolved um, and we will move forward. Um, great place to start is on competition. I think we all recognize that solar electrons and wind electrons are if not today, moving very quickly towards the lowest cost electrons, pairing them with energy storage makes them a superior asset as to coal or natural gas. So really we're, we're in a very, very different place than uh, when uh, Chairman Wellinghoff started his tenure at the uh, commission. Um, John, can I ask you to lead the second point here, incorporation of carbon well, markets? Well, I, into- I, I will. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, talking about valuation and, and right now, the fact that under the current market structures, solar and wind are the cheapest assets on the grid. But imagine if markets were actually fair, because markets are not fair, because we're not incorporating into those markets a very, very important cost, and that is the cost of carbon. We're yeah. not incorporating into those markets what the value is to consumers of having low carbon, res- low or no carbon resources incorporated into those markets, so that we don't uh, continue to have uh, the uh, you know serious climactic events we're we're uh, experiencing certainly in the West here where I am in, in Nevada currently and in California, you know the horrific situations they've seen there with the wildfires and i know throughout the east now is starting to get their dose of it from the canadian wildfires as well mm-hmm. and this is only going to get worse and worse we, we all know that i, I that, you know the, the papers have just had um you know reported recently that this fourth of july was the hottest day on earth we've ever ever seen uh, as an average temperature across the entire planet. Yeah. So having, um, having been doing this work for you know 22 <laughs> years, like you have, John, it's uh, the, the science has been pretty reputable yeah. throughout this entire journey. And sadly, we're living in the the uh, the existence of the science. So let's um, externalizing the cost of your generation seems to be something that many of the fossil combustors have been allowed to get away with. But your second suggestion here in solutions is around actually internalizing that cost, which would make solar and wind even more competitive. Uh, absolutely. And and that's why, um, you know, I, I would like to be an optimist like like my my friend, Neil uh, Chatterjee, and, uh, and I hope we can be optimistic. But, but I think to, you know, actualize that optimism, we really have to get realistic about what are the prices and costs to society of these things that are not now uh, internalized, but but are externalized? And so uh, I, I, that's why I put uh, incorporating the price of carbon into markets as a as the second uh, critical feature here. John, in your, in your modeling, a very quick question for you, John, and 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 maybe to Neil as well. Um, when we discuss a carbon market, obviously we've seen Europe try and stop and try and stop around getting the right price and allocation of allowances, et cetera. In your mind, what's the starting point? Is it $50 a ton? Is it $100 a ton? Where do we start? Or do we just start a buyer-seller market and go for it? You know, I, I've read a number of um, academic treatises on this. Um, and some people suggest we perhaps should start at a very high price, hmm. you know, several hundred dollars a ton. And if necessary, then work you know, work work backwards, work down to a lower price as as um, as more and more uh, low carbon resources get into in, into the system ultimately and driving and drives out these these fossil fossil uh, fuel based uh, resources. Um, you know, I don't think it would ver- it would take that that long if we did incorporate uh, you know a fairly high price uh, you know eighty a hundred dollars a ton uh, plus um into the system uh, to drive out um the remaining uh, fossil fuel resources and certainly they're already being driven out by uh the current low prices uh, yeah of, and of also wind, i think that and i also think that the financial markets are catching up here where you're seeing these new resources that are requiring fossil inputs are not getting financed because the 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 forward curve just doesn't support 
uh, these types of assets in the long term, especially if we're pairing with storage, a solar or wind asset, and the cost is still lower than natural gas on peak, you're going to see um, that financing problem. But let's let's move over to Neil here for a minute. And and uh, Chairman Wallinghoff is suggesting maybe maybe some uh, data suggests we should start at a very high price for the the carbon ton and and then Dutch auction down or in some mechanism move it down. Uh, what's your thinking about incorporating the cost of emissions and pollutions upon our society into someone that's creating those emissions? Yeah, this is something that uh, was central to my tenure at FERC and in the eyes of some led to my being fired as chair of the commission uh, by former President Trump. But what I dealt with during my tenure was a scenario in which we really struggled of trying to balance state decarbonization goals with the efficient function of markets. And what we found was in the absence of federal legislative guidance, specifically on carbon mitigation and decarbonization, increasingly states were taking it upon themselves to pursue their own policies to achieve their carbon reduction goals. And those policies, when you were dealing in multi-state markets, were distorting efficient market signals. And it put the commission, quite frankly, in an impossible situation. The, the largest market, PJM, in the mid-Atlantic came to FERC and essentially said that the status quo was unsustainable and that FERC had to take steps to amend PJM's tariffs to accommodate for the challenge of balancing these state policies with efficient market function. And what the commission did under my tenure, that was not an easy decision, but we implemented something called a minimum offer price rule that it's an oversimplification, basically required uh, bidders into a forward capacity auction to bid their true costs, not their subsidized costs. And that in turn led us to a situation where a number of generators and states contemplated exiting the competitive wholesale power markets. And that put me in a really challenging position. I'm someone who believes in markets, who believes that markets have developed or have delivered tremendous benefits for consumers, for the economy, and for the environment. We've been successfully squeezing carbon out of the U.S. power sector due to, in my belief, the, the, the contributions of competitive wholesale power markets. And so I wanted the power markets to succeed and to continue. And I was faced with this conundrum to where the market protective step that the commission took, the MOPR, was leading people to potentially exit the market, which would have led to the dissolution of the markets, which was also not an acceptable outcome. And I found myself in this impossible situation. And after much research, study, analysis, and talking to the foremost experts on the planet, came to the conclusion that a transparent price on carbon was the most effective way to enable that balance to occur, to enable states that wanted to meet their decarbonization goals to do so while still providing accurate market signals. Now, I take a little bit of a different viewpoint on this than Chairman Wellinghoff in that I didn't want to put FERC in a position of using its powerful authority under Section 206 to impose a price on carbon and potentially set that price. Uh, my approach was to enable the markets uh, and enable an RTO or an ISO or a state that wished to incorporate a price on carbon to come up to the commission via the Section 205 process, but to create a legal basis to make clear that FERC could make a determination on whether such a tariff amendment were just and reasonable. And I understand that that may not be as aggressive as some would uh, like to see, but I was trying to also balance the political realities around the fact that the price on carbon is tough because when uh, the economy is performing well and strongly, uh, energy tends to be at the core of that successful economic performance. And people are loath to do anything to disrupt that successful economic performance, like adding a price to energy. 
And when the economy is struggling and people are hurting, energy prices tend to, you know, uh, be sensitive and policymakers are loath to add an additional cost in that time. So there's never a good time politically to talk about a price on carbon, unfortunately. It doesn't mean that it's not the right policy to pursue. I simply thought that enabling an RTO or ISO to work its own stakeholder process and come up with a price on carbon that FERC could make a thumbs up or thumbs down call on was a step in the right direction. Thank you very much for those thoughts around emissions and incorporating that into price of things. Two different ideas here, one put forward by Chairman Wellinghoff of a FERC mandated carbon market. Um, and then we have a second suggestion of an RTO uh, ISO uh, based uh, pricing signal from uh, Chairman Chatterjee and, and both having their merits and both having their um, um, detractions. Uh, interestingly, uh, and it's no secret to anyone that the people that have the least voice, uh, low and medium income people are typically the ones that suffer the greatest consequence of emissions. And um, my personal view is we need it fast and we need it uh, to, to be actually market moving. And whichever mechanism gets us there faster would be appropriate. Sadly, I think that we've toiled long enough on the emissions price and we've gotten very little progress. So uh, whichever way goes faster. Um, John, I'm going to ask you to introduce the third solution here, um, which is uh, uh, another great one. Well, and it's uh, a subset of the uh, of the first one of of uh, you know making all energy services competitive. And if we're going to make them competitive, then we need to ensure, at least at the wholesale market level, that uh, you know those those independently operated uh, and and overseen competitive wholesale markets are everywhere in the United States. And and right now uh, they're only uh, in certain regions, uh, throughout the Southeast, all of Florida, uh, most of, uh, uh, Mississippi, um, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, uh, there is no independent wholesale market whatsoever. Uh, also, uh, in the Western United States, with the exception of, of, uh, California, um, west of the Rockies, uh, there's not a a full robust market, although they're they're moving uh, in that direction, and and I really believed when I was at FERC and we were trying to move markets um, into the southeast and and into the west, it would have happened by now. I mean that was ten years ago when I when I left FERC. Um, it's been a very slow process, and as Neil indicated uh, when we were talking about. Uh, carbon prices. I mean, it, it it always is a balance about how much authority FERC has to push these things forward uh, versus uh, the the authority given by Congress. Um, and you know, if you don't have the explicit authority by Congress, you always uh, you know are on the uh, the knife edge of of you know if FERC acts, whether or not that's going to be appealed and, and 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 struck down by the courts because uh, you don't have the sufficient congressional authority to move forward. I know my good friend, uh, former uh, Chairman Pat Wood, who was the chair of FERC, uh, two um, commissions before me. Um, this was his idea, really not mine, uh, to put uh, uh, ISOs and wholesale markets everywhere throughout the United States. Um, and he moved aggressively to do that and was told in no uncertain terms by the White House that if he continued to do it, that Congress would likely reverse it. Um, and so he stopped, uh, unfortunately. But yet, uh, but yet, John, we have a an FAA, we have a group that regulates the airwaves, we have marine federal uh, protections, we have highways, railroads, telecoms, these are all non-balkanized independent operations as in energy. Why is it impossible today? And maybe this is a question we can have both of you answer. Why is it so impossible today? Is it because of the very wealthy incumbents that have a vested interest in holding down their little region as chiefs? Or is there another reason that I don't understand why we can't have a federal regulator that deals with the entirety of the United States as one, uh, as one unit? 
Well, in my opinion, I think, John, you're right. It's primarily because there are very powerful incumbent monopoly interests in these regions uh, that, that wish to retain those monopolies. In the West, that's breaking up. We've, we now have uh, the states of, Cal, of uh, excuse me, of Nevada and, and, and Colorado, both of those states, their legislatures have voted to require that their utilities go into an ISO RTO, that there be an independent wholesale market, uh, that, that, that those utilities join. So um, the states uh, and the people in those states are understanding that there are tremendous financial benefits to consumers by having this competitive open wholesale process uh, available uh, to consumers and, and to uh, the utilities that are doing business in those areas that will drive down prices uh, for everyone. So, you know, that's, that's starting to break. It's starting to open up. It's just, <laughs> it's just so glacially slow that it's very, very maddening and frustrating for me but, to but see. But you've also mentioned a massive part of the United States, the Southeast, that has no ISO at the moment and could potentially be joining a federal agency. And let me turn it over to Neil now to get his get his view on a real FERC, well, a FERC that had real jurisdiction over the entirety of the United States around energy at large. Yeah, look, uh, I'm from the Southeast. I'm from Kentucky. Uh, I was encouraged lately to see that even the Southeast uh, is expressing a willingness to at least explore moving towards uh, a market. Uh, they uh, acted on a SEAM proposal, the Southeast uh, market proposal, that didn't go as far as I would have wished for it to go, but it was at least a step in the right direction towards creating a market in the Southeast. I think that effort, coupled with some of the efforts I'm seeing out West, are very encouraging to me. That said, I think there are huge obstacles that we need to be cognizant of. For whatever reason, we are finding ourselves in a position in 2023 into which there seems to be a growing animus towards the existing market constructs and in a strange way could be a pulling back away from markets, particularly capacity markets. What I think we're seeing is that... Um, and, and I, I don't like to speak for anyone else. And so these are just my observations of what may or may not be some of the views of the current commissioners on FERC, but some of the conservative commissioners sort of feel that in the absence of a hardcore MOPR, which I described earlier, that the markets aren't working, we should take a step back towards, you know, kind of traditional uh, vertically integrated utility models with the cost of service recovery, which I think would be a setback for consumers, for the economy and for the environment. But you also have some of the more progressive commissioners who I think view capacity payments in particular as offering a lifeline to otherwise non-economic uh, fossil generators, probably peaker plants. And that, that sort of you know coming together of minds on folks from opposite viewpoints concerns because I don't want to see the United States take a step away from markets. I would much rather us move towards greater market expansion. Um, and then, you know, the final you know point on this and uh, Chairman Wellinghoff alluded to it about, you know, FERC's power and what FERC can do in this regard. And there are some people who have asked, why isn't FERC more assertive in using its power to sort of force market expansion. And the reason there, and, and this is kind of interesting for the listeners, uh, uh, as you educate them on how these things come about, I don't think this was by any sort of design. I think it was just a total fluke of history and politics. But the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee of the United States Senate is the committee that has primary jurisdiction and oversight of FERC, including FERC confirmation process. So all future and current FERC commissioners who wish to seek another term have to go before that committee in the United States Senate. If you look at the roster of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, by total fluke, 
most of the senators come from non-competitive states, from states that aren't participants in wholesale competitive markets. And some of them are resistant to having such markets forced upon them. And so it's really hard for a uh, for interested nominee to go before the Senate Energy Committee and talk about potentially using FERC authority to impose a market on a region that might be resistant to it. So there's all of these factors that are potential headwinds to market expansion in the country. Um, and it's frustrating at a time where I think, you know, we're seeing the benefits of markets more than ever. Um, I hope that we can overcome this, this brief sort of period where there seems to be some skepticism, frustration of markets and, and, and move back towards an embrace of markets. But we're in a, we're in a perilous time right now. Those are great observations and uh, sort of an inside baseball view of how the sausage is made with the Senate committee. And maybe listeners, if they're interested in having a FERC that has jurisdiction over the entire United States, one should advocate with their representatives in Washington to have um, folks on that committee uh, based on how they're assigned to be more supportive of this stuff. So a good inside baseball view, uh, Chairman Chatterjee. Thank you for that. And we're going to go ahead here, just in the spirit of keeping on time. Uh, one of the ones that uh, has been cited as a very difficult one, but um, I, I, I really don't like to hear uh, Chairman Wellinghoff say it's been 10 years and we've made very little progress as we did on that last subject. Um, I, I mean, we really have to start charging forward faster in my mind, but let's get on to the hard one, the SDM, which is uh, yeah. standard market design. Yeah, we've made no progress on this one. Um, <laughs> as Chairman Chatterjee alluded to with respect to capacity market issues and, and some of the reversals with the, uh, some of the more conservative members of FERC, uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, as Chairman Chatterjee said, um, you know, we are seeing um, somewhat of a retrenchment on the issue of uh, certain market structures. And this idea of standard market design, just for me to set it up, again, this was another uh, concept by uh, my, my friend, former Chairman Pat Wood, uh, who um, wanted to not only expand markets throughout the United States, but believed that the structure of those markets should be the same everywhere. And here's the concept that I think is, is really important for competition. If I'm a um, merchant generator and I want to do business in Maine or Massachusetts in ISO New England, and I have a market structure there, my market structure there should be no different than my market structure should be in California or in Texas. Well, Texas obviously is outside of Burke's jurisdiction, but that's that's another whole issue we can get into, or maybe that's another whole program. But but in any case, um, you know, the, the way that the market runs for a generator, uh, a, a, a solar uh, system provider, a uh, wind farm, uh, or even a fossil fuel generator, the way the market um, you know, treats that generator and the way that it compensates that generator should be in a consistent manner. Certainly prices will be different because of congestion and 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 regional variances and in 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 load and other issues. But the basic market rules, the market design should be the same. And not only for the generation side, but for the demand side as well that we're going to get into in a bit here when we start talking about Order 2222 and IDSOs and some of these other things. Um, ultimately, um, all of the demand side providers that have distributed energy resources should be treated the same and be under the same market rules everywhere. We shouldn't have to have, you know, a different rule for uh, metering and verification in PGM as we do in MISO, as we do in, in California and in CAISO, because, you know, if you have to operate under multiple different rules, it's very difficult then as a competitive provider to ultimately uh, access those markets. It is a barrier to market access, to not having standard market design throughout the country. 
And now, scaling with, and scaling is and scaling on, and right? scaling yeah. and scaling exactly and scaling these things as well. Yeah. Now, with that said, you know, th- th- this is a very difficult, difficult thing to do because of, in part, the fact that uh, these market rules are largely a product of the stakeholder processes in each one of these individual market regions, and those stakeholders are, <clears throat> in many instances. Uh, dominated by the incumbents within those regions who want to preserve their structures and rules for their incumbent resources, whether it be generation or other resources in the area. So, you know, as as a result, um, you know, we have had, you know, very little traction. Uh, We are seeing you know, all kinds of retrenchment with with things with respect to capacity markets. And I'm not necessarily a a, a total fan of the capacity markets. I I think that there does need to be certainly some provision for resource adequacy in some way. Uh, California does it one way. Uh, Certainly PGM does it, but does it in a much different way. Uh, Texas is struggling with it as well uh, in their uh, market design. Uh, but but there there needs to it needs to be done in some way. But I think it, once we decide what is the best way, what is the most efficient way to do it, um, you know, it needs to be uniform, and those uniform rules need to be incorporated into markets uh, throughout the country. That's our those are great statements, um, Neil. Let me move to you now. Is it a requirement to have a unified FERC in order to have SDM work correctly? I, I think it's more than a, a unified FERC. I think it's it's a unified uh, unified industry, and I think therein lies the challenge. Um, even just reforms to the stakeholder process. This is something that I think has come on the radar of Congress and other FERC overseers who uh, believe that there are genuine you know structural changes that could be made within the RTL ISO stakeholder process, and they're hopeful that FERC could use its administrative strength to try and compel changes to the stakeholder process. But what I have found is that the the differences in different regions are such that a one size fits all sort of stakeholder reform approach, I think would struggle because the challenges and obstacles um, that exist in PJM are different than those that exist in CAISO or in MISO or in New England. And so I think therein lies an additional challenge to SMD is that the different regions have kind of evolved in different ways to where, um, yes, you are seeing some similarities uh, uh, across the regions, but there are also some substantial differences. And so trying I think today to force a one size fits all approach, I I do think would be met with considerable resistance and and therein lies the biggest challenge. Got it. Now, as the uh, champion of 2222, Neil, I'm going to let you introduce this next solution, which is a fully and fairly implemented order 2222. I know that some of these ideas originated under prior uh, leadership, but um, you were the one to get it over the line, I believe, if I'm if I, my information is correct. Talk us through a little bit about fully and fairly implementing Order 2022 would do for this solution set. Yeah, uh, I would say FERC Order 2222 is amongst my proudest achievements at the commission, and uh, I couldn't have done it without some of the, the intellectual thought leadership of my predecessors, including former Chairman Norman Bay and as well as Chairman Wellinghoff. Uh, when I first came to the commission, um, uh, I, I had had a couple of senators who had uh, put a hold on my confirmation. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts. Uh, they objected to my, my confirmation and they brought me in and they said, look, we understand uh, at the time that uh, I was going through the process, FERC had lost a quorum for a period of about seven months. And there was a lot of pressure to get the quorum restored and get FERC back to work in order to address a significant backlog in pipeline certificate applications that had begun to accrue at the commission. And what Senators uh, Markey and Whitehouse said was, we understand there's going to be a lot 
uh, of pressure when you take the job from within uh, stakeholders of the commission to start acting on these pipelines. But FERC has begun a process of evaluating removing barriers to entry to energy storage and to aggregated distributed energy resources. And we simply, you know, we want we don't want you to promise an outcome one way or the other, but just take a look at it and study the docket and, and see what you think. And I made that commitment. And once I took my seat at the commission, I, I fulfilled the, the 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 promise I made to a couple of United States senators, and I started to dig into the issues. And what I quickly realized was there was real opportunity here. And someone who believes in innovation and opportunity, this could be transformative. What I what I quickly saw was that we were way further along on energy storage, and there were some complicated behind the meter issues regarding DERs that would take longer to sort out. And so I broke apart the two. Uh, rules into separate rules. The first was FERC Order 841 on storage. And it wound up being a masterstroke that I didn't even realize at the time because we learned from the 841 implementation process and then, uh, ultimately also were backed up by the DC Circuit, which uh, upheld the Commission's approach uh, on a challenge by EEI. NRECA, APPA, and NARU, and that put us on stronger legal footing to move forward with ultimately what was FERC Order 2222. Uh, and I was really excited about 2222. You know, when I think about DERs, I think about electric vehicles, rooftop solar, advanced appliances, you know, um, uh, technologies that hide in plain sight, but have tremendous power. And the idea behind 2222 was really that if you're a single EV owner, your ability to impact a power market is nil. But if through the power of innovation and aggregation, you can harness thousands upon thousands of EVs, suddenly you're competing against the power plant down the street and you're doing it at the point of demand. And I really believe that if properly implemented, FERC Order 2222, we may look back and say it was the, the single most significant action the agency could have taken to address carbon mitigation and to really fundamentally alter the way that Americans generate, distribute, and consume power. And the really exciting thing about it, if you just want to focus narrowly on the EV angle, is that if this power sector rule actually leads to the accelerated deployments of electric vehicles, then not only are you mitigating carbon emissions in the power sector, but also are contributing to emissions reductions in the automotive sector, which is a far greater source of emissions in the US. So it's really, really exciting with a big but. And the but is in that compliance and implementation process. And what we're seeing is some resistance in some of the regions because this is new and because this is complicated. And you have one region in particular which says that they cannot possibly comply with the obligations of FERC Order 2222 before 2030 at the earliest, which I just think is absurd. And I said it at the time, and I continue to believe it today, the difference between 2222 being uh, an effective rule and a historically transformative one will come down to the compliance and implementation process. And I have no doubt that because of the complexity, because of the change associated with the rule, there will be resistance across the regions. But it's really important that stakeholders uh, step up. And one of the reasons I was motivated to do this program today was to encourage people that don't typically engage with FERC or engage with the RTOs and the ISOs to not be intimidated, to make sure that their voices are heard, and to, to work with other stakeholders to make sure that we get all of the benefits and, and take advantage of the potential that this rulemaking has to offer. That, that was a great setup, and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, uh, Chairman Chatterjee, about um, today's Senate makeup of that committee to which the FERC commissioner's report, we're going to need to call some people out. So after this, we're going to, you and I are going to make a list and then we're going to have people calling those offices to say, we want more support for these things. The second thing I want to do is who are the people that said they couldn't do 2222 by 2030? I mean, we got to call them out too. But before we do that, and and thank you, I, I'm using a little comedy here, but but really we need to start naming names and we need to start getting this job done because you know we can talk in broad strokes 
And we can talk about why SMD is not possible. We can talk about why FERC is a unified FERC is not possible. But until we start calling out names and saying that is the party that's got their thumb on the scale, let's go find out why they or what they need to be satisfied, the carrots and the sticks. Chairman Wellinghoff, the great 2222 841 comments from you. Yes, no, I, I want to commend my friend and colleague, uh, Chairman Chatterjee, for what he did in 841 and 2222. And I think he's right. I agree with him. I think 2222 has the potential to be the greatest um, Im impactful role uh, on, on carbon issues that FERC has ever issued. I mean, th think about it this way. Just let me put it in a little context here quickly for your listeners. <clears throat> if, as projected by 2030, there are somewhere between 20 and 25 million electric vehicles on the roads in the US. The battery capacity in those electric vehicles will be more than the capacity in all the current electric generating stations in the United States. So the potential for the utilization of those vehicles for, and as you, you alluded to it uh, at the beginning the program, John, the, the cashback car, which which is uh, uh, actually a term I coined uh, back in um, 2008, um, where ultimately with a vehicle to grid connection, i.e. plugging in your car and charging it while you're charging it, you can actually provide grid services like regulation services to the grid, which we demonstrated in 2008 in the FERC driveway with an electric vehicle that was plugged in and which we had a PGM engineer there with his laptop signaling the car to provide regulation services to PGM, to PGM's control room at the time. We demonstrated that there's a potential there for monetary returns for consumers who have these vehicles that can use these for these purposes. And at that time, it was up to uh, 7 to $10 per day uh, per vehicle that could be earned by ultimately providing these types of services. So 2222 has great potential. But, uh, you know, as Neil said, as Chairman Chatterjee said, the implementation is so important, and I, it sort of, I'll throw, I want to throw a question back to Neil, because I want to challenge him a little bit, because on this SMD issue, I believe that SMD should apply to everything. SMD should apply to 2222. I believe that we need to implement 2222, but we need to in, implement it uniformly across the country. We cannot have different metering requirements for electric vehicles in New England than we have for electric vehicles in California to participate under 2222. Those standards need to be uniform under 2222 if we're going to expect the automakers and others to be able to, you know, and uh, aggregators to effectively participate under 2222. So I would say that the place to start with SMD is order 2222. And I think it's actually doable there. If FERC could step up, it's doable there. If, if I could just weigh in there, since uh, Chairman Wallingoff did ask me the question, here's where, for your listeners, John, this gets just incredibly interesting, complicated, frustrated, however you want to say it, all of the above. So one of the reasons I think FERC currently has been reluctant to be more assertive on making sure that 2222 is implemented in the manner in which Chairman Wallingoff lays out, which I'm strongly supportive is the focus on transmission. And right now, now in, that is the, the primary focus of the commission right now is getting transmission reforms right. And it's at the thrust of what we're discussing here today, fixing the broken interconnection queue process, getting a solution on siting, on cost allocation, on interregional planning, on putting competition into transmission. But all of this, today is requiring a delicate balance between FERC and the states. And as a result right now, I think FERC is really, really reluctant to kind of push the envelope with the states. And uh, in, a, in a weird way, I think it's inhibiting the commission from doing what it wants to do on being more assertive on 2222 
compliance implementation, the fact that they want to preserve the, the current detente with the states and not force something on the states that uh, they're reluctant to do so at a time when they need maximum state cooperation on transmission. So I'm not saying that Chairman Wellinghouse is not completely correct on SMD and on 2222. I think the obstacle is interestingly tied to transmission and what it will take to successfully get transmission reform done. Or we could have FERC just become the master of all, and then they just do as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems to go back to this. Easier Senate said than, easy, yes, easier said but, than but that. Chairman Chatterjee, it, it seems to go back to this magical Senate committee that that the FERC commissioners answer to and have a little bit of fear about. Um, and if we can adjust that Senate committee to represent more of the people's interests, the the energy users' interests, we might have uh, a situation that would be more tenable. Um, great comments on both around SMDs and, and of course, FERC 2222. Great acknowledgement of uh, 841 as a, as a predecessor and a real setting the stage for you know, unfortunately, we hear at the uh, at the the CPU levels um, the what has been characterized as the decline or defanging of 2022 happening sort of in real time, uh, unfortunately, and, and the next point around uh, prohibit anti-competitive behavior um, was cited by both commissioners as something that, you know, we really need to get right. And, and the solution here is what? How do we prevent uh, this type of behavior? Is it higher fees for people getting caught? Is it jail time, actual doing a perp walk, or how do we make this stick? I'll start here. I have a more sympathetic view here. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily take the view that there's nefarious actors here trying to avoid competition. Uh, I take the more charitable view that I just think the incentives are misaligned. And to me, the answer here is, is finding a better way to incentivize the incumbents to embrace the opportunities uh, and not look at the introduction of innovation as a threat to uh, uh, their monopolies. And so, and this is something quite frankly that my staff and I wrestled with when we were putting together 2222. There are several on my team who really felt as if we should structure the rule in a manner to better enable smaller, new entrants to come into the markets and compete. And I had others on my team say, Neil, if you really want to see the benefits of this rulemaking maximized in an accelerated fashion, the key will be to find a way to make the big incumbent utilities incentivized to do it and so they can make money off of it and, and profit from it and view it as an opportunity and not as a threat. And so I, I like to take the more positive, charitable view that if we can find a way to work with utilities to, uh, you know, incentivize them and better properly align the incentive structure so that they want to avail themselves of these opportunities uh, rather than viewing them as a threat, uh, I would like to try that. Uh, John and I have worked on some matters together where we've been frustrated by the reaction that we have seen from some of the counterparties we have attempted to work with. I'm not going to name and shame. I'll keep it very vague, but <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it, it is frustrating because I, I think there is a constructive conversation to be had here. We just have to get stakeholders to the table uh, who are willing to compromise and understand that everyone can win here. And this doesn't have to be some zero sum game where there's a winner and a loser. Thank you, Chairman Chatterjee, for those ideas around prohibit the anti-competitive behavior side of things. For the sake of um, um, brevity, uh, Chairman Wellinghoff, shall we move to DSO, D IDSOs, sure. the uh, in the distribution service operators? Sure, I'd be happy to. I I wrote a paper. It must be now uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, on this concept of an independent distribution system operator. And I was simply taking an analogy from what FERC had already done at the wholesale level, where, where, where FERC had uh, enabled, um, you know, through Order 888, 889, 
and the ability to create these independent uh, system operators for uh, the operation of the wholesale um, transmission system as an RTO ISO, regional transmission operator, independent system operator, and as a market operator. And taking that same concept down to the distribution level, especially to the extent that um, you know, we have talked here, um, Commissioner uh, Chairman Chatterjee um, and yourself have talked about um, EVs and other distributed resources and the important of, importance of those resources. Those resources, first of all, live down at the distribution level, and they are going to become exceedingly important not only to providing wholesale uh, transmission level services, which in fact they are doing now and capable of doing uh, demand response and uh, distributed generation and distributed storage are all serving uh, and providing support to that wholesale uh, market level uh, throughout the country and keeping the lights on. But they will be able to do similar things at the distribution level as well. And if we have then markets at a distribution level, providing you know um, inter uh, consumer services between you know my house that has the um, solar system on on its rooftop and Neil's house across the street that needs some energy, um, you know having those kinds of transactions is going to require an independent operator. It's going to require somebody independent from the distribution monopoly wires provider. Uh, and they are not the one uh, to be the proper party, ultimately, to provide uh, that independent platform for those transactions. Uh, I would also add, we've talked about EVs quite a bit, but I mean, we can also look at, as an, at, at any HVAC system, whether it's residential or commercial yes. or industrial, as uh, something that we can uh, manage as a resource behind the meter and can really benefit the local distribution network tremendously. So, Tr truly, truly, any any load uh, that is behind the meter. I mean, think about your refrigerator's defrost cycle. Do you care yeah. when when your refrigerator freezer defrosts or not? You don't. So if you can, you know, switch that in, in ways that you, it can benefit the grid and provide you with value, value back to you as a consumer, we should be able to ena enable that and right. enable it not only at the wholesale level, which we are doing now, but down at the distribution level. But to do that you need an independent distribution system operator. Yeah, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading at the local level is quite compelling, uh, especially with people that are investing in these assets. Let me get uh, Chairman Chatterjee's uh, thoughts on uh, IDSO and uh, the potential for a solution there. I actually don't have anything to add to what Chairman Willinghoff laid out. He's given a lot more thought to this than I have, and so I defer Great. to his expertise and experience. Great. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, I, I just want to summarize, uh, as we've talked about six different ideas. First is competition. Second is a carbon price. The third is possibly having FERC everywhere, magically, how wonderful yeah. that would be. And we're going to have to get that Senate committee call out. Um, we're going to develop the SMB world uh, around that unified market. We're going to have a fair and full implementation of Order 2022. The, the master stroke of uh, Chairman Chatterjee, based on a lot of prior uh, thought leadership by others, including uh, Chairman Wellinghoff, anti-competitive behavior being uh, punished. Uh, one of the suggestions there was uh, maybe we give incentives for the incumbents to move in this direction of DERs. And then finally, uh, really develop a market around um, independent distribution service operators so that we can have a true peer-to-peer -peer valuing of not only generation from renewables, but also um, load flexibility delivered by behind-the-meter assets. Um, this has been an absolutely incredible session together. Um, I want to give Ted Thomas a chance to chime in if he has any questions for either the chairman, um, or if not, we can just conclude and uh, put a top on this and and hopefully do another session uh, in the future. Ted? All right. Ted doesn't have anything okay. more to say. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, nope, I've enjoyed the conversation. Don't have any questions. I thank uh, both former chairman for their uh, time. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you, Ted, for your prior contributions to session 101 and, and 201. And we encourage people to watch those. We're going to have these slides down below in the show notes so everyone can share them amongst their friends. Um, I want to give great thanks to both uh, Chairman Wellinghoff and Chairman Chatterjee, and of course, Ted Thomas for his long commitment to this idea of educating everyone around these really important issues of interconnecting and fair operation of renewable behind the meter assets and distributed energy resources. Thanks everyone and talk to you soon. All right, we're gonna break that down and we'll edit out the back bit. Um, thank you all for doing this session together. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we might even have further communication around next steps, but I know you've all gotta go. And um, thanks again. Thank you, John. Thanks. Uh